All right, good morning, everyone. So yesterday, I was asked by various people to perhaps provide some references about um, convergence properties of this conformal block decomposition and the OPE decomposition and uh, properties of the conformal blocks in this uh, ZZ bar plane that we were talking about. So let me just give you here the archive numbers of two papers that perhaps can serve as a good starting point if you're interested in looking into that literature. And okay, so these are two papers that you might, uh, you might look at for, for these kinds of properties of conformal blocks. Okay, so yesterday we looked at the crossing equation and um, we realized various things about it. In particular, when we looked at it in various limits, we saw things like uh, you know, the, the presence of an infinite number of conformal primary operators being necessary uh, for the consistency of crossing in, a, in any uh, conformal field theory. Um, and there are various, various things that have been uh, discussed in this analytic bootstrap way. Of course, you can use the crossing equation to do things like derive uh, perturbative results. You can do this analytically. Uh, you can use the crossing equation in that way to derive results of the epsilon expansion, large n expansion. You can do, you can do analytical calculations uh, because, uh, and this requires an appropriate understanding of the behavior of conformal blocks in various limits. Um, but what is perhaps uh, more impressive, not that that is not impressive, but what is perhaps more impressive is that the, the conformal bootstrap has a numerical uh, implementation. There is a way to look at the crossing equation numerically, which allows you to derive rigorous bounds on operator dimensions. Well, we already have bounds on operator dimensions from unitarity. Those are lower bounds. The conformal bootstrap numerically allows you to find upper bounds on operator dimensions, and we'll see how that works today. Um, and this was, you know, back in 2008, although the crossing equation that we have written down had existed for many, many, many years, in 2008 it was uh, the first time people realized how to use the then known conformal blocks, uh, how to put them in, uh, in, in a numerical implementation and derive constraints, some of which uh, I think came as a surprise uh, to the original authors and to the community. So let's see how the numerical bootstrap, this will basically be the, uh, the content of the last, the last lectures here today. And let me write down again the crossing equation from the four-point function of a single scalar operator phi. So there was a sum over O. O here, remember, are only the primaries. And then we had some three-point function coefficients squared. Um, and then we were able to write down the, the crossing equation in this way. where this is zero, this infinite sum is zero, and there's an infinite sum here, and for each of these uh, operators, there's an associated conformal block summing up the contributions of the descendants. It's common in the bootstrap literature to take this whole thing and call it F delta comma L of U and V, okay? Some, some, some people call this, I don't know how universal this terminology is, but they call it convolved conformal block. Okay. From the form of this equation, it does not seem at all obvious that you will get 
that you will get um, what I said in the beginning, that you will get bounds, upper bounds on operator dimensions. So let's try to see how you might convince yourself that something like that will happen. And the way we're going to do this is we are going to consider these functions, again, in these zz bar coordinates instead of u and v, it's just the transformation uh, change of variables. And moreover, we will take z equal to z bar, OK? We can just, you know, take z equal to z bar, no problem. <laughs> and just for the plots that I'm going to show here, uh, let's take the space-time dimension to be 4, OK? And let's take delta phi to be 1 at this point, consistent with the unitarity bound in a four-dimensional theory. It saturates the unitarity bound. It's a free field, but we can take this value. Then what you can do is the following. You can plot in four dimensions. Remember, we wrote down explicit expressions of these functions in terms of uh, products of 2F1 hypergeometric functions, right? So you can just put that in any uh, computer program that you like, and you, unless you know how to plot the hypergeometric function, which is impressive, uh, you can go put it in any computer program that you like and just plot it. Choose z equals z bar. It's a single variable plot. And you know, choosing z equals z bar allows you to look at this on the plane as opposed to looking at a 3D plot, which there is no one in the world that can understand what's happening in a 3D plot. Uh, so you do it this way, and then you say, OK, let me now make some choices for these deltas and l's. So let's choose l equal to 2. And let's plot this. We're going to plot this between 0 and 1. This is z equals z bar, and this is f. For l equal 2, we'll turn, choose various deltas. So let me, this starts like this, and then it goes down, and it's, it's, although it doesn't look like it, it's symmetric around, this is supposed to be the point 1 half. And this is, say, if you chose delta equal 4. If you chose something larger, it looks like this again. So this is for delta equal 5. Let me write it like. So this curve over here is for delta equal 4, and this is for delta equal 5. Uh, and if you keep doing this, you get things that look like this. So for example, this will be for delta equals 6. OK. So at this point, it looks like this functions f at l equal 2 have this local, this, uh, this local minimum here. OK? So it looks like the second derivative of these functions, uh, no matter what you choose for this delta, uh, well, at large enough delta, anyway, um, is, uh, is negative. Sorry, is positive for the, for the minimum. OK. And then you can do the same exercise for and again, you plot the s, but maybe now for l equal 4. Remember, in the OPE of phi with phi, we have uh, typically, we, we only, uh, by Bose symmetry, we only have even spin operators. And again, again, you get things like this. Again, you get things that look like this. No matter what delta you choose, you always get things that have a local minimum here. And what you end up finding in these plots is that f double prime for delta and l for the choices that we made is bigger than 0 at z equals z bar equals a half. And you can keep plotting. And then, well, this is not a proof because you can plot everything. But for 2, 4, 6, and so on, it looks like what you get at this point is always this positive second derivative. OK? And by continuity as well, well, we chose delta phi equal to 1 to do this. But by continuity, you can say, well, you know, even if I choose 1 plus epsilon for epsilon something very small, plots are going to look like this. 
So very close to delta phi equal one, these plots are gonna keep looking like this, okay? As you increase delta, you get these types of plots. Okay, good, so you can already say from this that there cannot be a conformal field theory that has only phi as a scalar operator and not another scalar operator in the OPE of phi with itself. Because, well, if it's unitary. So what we will assume, first of all, is that this is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay? Um, and we have an infinite sum, we have a positive number, and I can take the second derivative on the crossing equation, right? So I will make all these f's into f double primes, which satisfy this condition, right? And then I will be proving that a sum of positive numbers, if these are all positive and there is no L equals zero contribution, a sum of positive numbers is equal to zero, which is obviously not true. The only way for it to not be true is for them, some of these lambda squares to not actually be bigger than zero, but then we're in the non-unitary regime, and in that case, we can say that as far as unitary theories are, constrained, are concerned, there is a constraint that there have to be operators in the OPE of phi with itself that are scalars. It cannot be just spinning operators on the right-hand side. Okay? Good, so that's the first, the first uh, consequence. And then you can plot what things look like for spin L equals zero, okay? And for L equals zero, there seems to be a different behavior. At small delta, so this is again one, at small delta, things look like this. So this is how they look at delta small. But then there is a critical delta where they start looking like this again. This is, this is, I'm not doing this very well, but, so this is for small dimension of the operator in the phi phi OPE, the first one that you allow, you get this behavior. So you do get a negative second derivative, but you only get it if you are at small enough dimension for the corresponding operator. If you go to high enough dimension, you don't get it anymore. You get again a positive second derivative which means not only that you need operators that are scalars in the OPE of phi with itself, you also need them with dimension that is bounded from above. You need them with dimension below a certain value for which this second derivative becomes positive again at the point uh, z equals z bar equal a half. So this is, as far as I know, a simple, uh, sort of, well, it's not a proof because, of course, you know, we haven't established properties of these functions or their second derivatives at the point z equals z bar equal a half rigorously, but the numerical exploration that we did here indicates that there is the need for a scalars, the need for scalars in the phi phi OPE, and they have to have dimension below a certain value. So this is how you uh, motivate the existence of an upper bound on operator dimensions um, and that it follows from the crossing equation. Any questions about this? To have, to have phi itself, you mean, in the phi phi? Yeah, you could have it. Yeah, you could have it, yes, yes, yes. The point is that you need at least one scalar, and its dimension cannot be above, um, above a certain value. The, that's the point of this, um, of this exercise here. Okay, so the result of all this, let me just write it down. In the phi times phi OP,
there needs to exist at least one scalar with delta below a certain critical value, delta C. Okay? And, you know, these considerations tell you basically that around this point, Z equals Z bar equal a half, convexity properties of the convolved conformal blocks is all that allows you to make this statement. Okay, of course, this was just a very simple way to motivate that a bound exists. Uh, what, you, what you then do is you say, okay, instead of looking at just second derivatives, I could be looking at a lot more sophisticated uh, uh, functionals, if you want. Uh, because here I took the second derivative of this, evaluated at the point one half, but I could look at more complicated functionals, and maybe this will allow me to get more constraints. So let's see how we use this logic to get constraints on OPE coefficients. So for constraints on OPE coefficients, we take the crossing equation with the Fs. And we're going to write it as follows. We are going to take two operators out of it. We're going to take the identity operator, which is exchanged in the phi phi OPE, and we are, it has an associated F. We are going to take another operator as well. We'll call it O0. So I'll take this, and then we're going we're gonna to send, we're going to keep O0. So this is O0. We're going to keep it on this side, along with the associated convolved block, delta 0, L0. And then we're going to send everything else to the other side, OK? So I'm going to get minus F0, 0, 0, because the identity, I will normalize my blocks so that the uh, coefficient, the three-point function coefficient of the identity is equal to 1. Okay, I don't have to do it, but I can do it, so it's going to be like this. And the identity has dimension 0 and spin 0. Okay? And then I have an infinite sum over all the operators that are not the identity and are not this O0 that I kept on this side. Okay, so I just rewrote the same crossing equation. Now, what I will do is I will take a functional, so these are functions of zz bar, or u and v, or zz bar. I will take a functional, alpha. I will leave this unspecified for now, but the way this functional alpha works is it takes this function, f in, and it gives a number, okay? So, this functional on this f's, uh, let's say, belongs to the real numbers. Okay? Good. And now this is going to be chosen, uh, th this is going to be a linear functional, and I will act with this linear functional on this crossing equation. So I'm going to write something like O0 squared alpha. is minus alpha on f 0, 0, minus infinite sum of operators other than the identity n O0. Okay, good. And now I imagine the following situation. I imagine that I can find alpha. So assume there exists alpha such that um, alpha on all this f delta comma l is bigger than or equal to zero where this delta L are not, you know, delta zero or zero, are not this delta zero operator we have on that side in the identity. And also, alpha on F 
delta zero L zero is equal to one. And for any functional that is positive on this, on this convolved block, I can always normalize it to make it equal to one. So it's not, uh, that's not really non-trivial. Positivity is really what the non-trivial thing is. Then if I can do this, okay, then alpha on f delta zero L zero is equal to one. So on the left-hand side, I'll just have lambda phi phi O zero squared. On the right-hand side, I will have minus alpha on f uh, zero comma zero minus a sum by unitarity, we say that this is positive. So it's positive and by this condition, we say that the action of the function on all these f's will, gi will give us a positive number. So it's a sum of positive times positive. So this is positive, which then means that this is less than or equal to minus alpha of f0, 0. Okay? So if in the space of functionals that satisfy these constraints, I find the one that minimizes minus alpha on f, 0 comma 0 on the block of the identity, then this gives me the tightest bound within that space of functions that I can get for the uh, square of the OP coefficient associated with the operator O0. And we get an upper bound if we can do this. And it shows that, you know, the, op the sort of the interaction strength as measured by this OP, co this OP coefficient, lambda phi phi O0 for its contribution of the operator O0 to the phi phi OP is bounded no matter how strongly coupled you might make your CFT. Here we made no reference to a Lagrangian. We didn't do any perturbative computations. We didn't do any of this. This is completely general. Assuming we can find such alphas, uh, it doesn't matter how strongly coupled your CFT is, you will be getting bounds on the interaction strength as measured by these three point function coefficients. Okay? Any questions about this? Okay, so the way this alpha is chosen typically, so alpha, this functional alpha, is typically chosen to be of the following form. Um, evaluate it at So you take a bunch of z derivatives and a bunch of z bar derivatives. You take a linear combination of them where you sum over um, uh, up to a certain lambda, a certain bound. Of course, you cannot consider an infinite functional in this way. You will have to give a, give a, a, a cutoff for how high derivatives you consider. And you act on these f's and then you evaluate at z equals z bar equal a half which is a particularly well-behaved point. It's particularly well-behaved because if you, if you look at the crossing equation, on one side we have the blocks at z comma z bar. On the other side we have them at one minus z comma one minus z bar. And the point one half is the point where both z z bar and one minus z one minus z bar agree, right? So uh, it's a particular, uh, particularly important point around which uh, you can analyze the crossing equation. Yes. There is a sum over MNN. There, there is a sum over MNN that satis where the sum of MNN stays below a certain number. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, thank you. There is some coefficients a m n alpha m n here, uh, and uh, and. Um, Thank you. And this is really where the numerical part of it comes in. What you do when you set this up on the computer, the computer is really searching over such coefficients. What the computer is doing is for every lambda that you choose, there's going to be a certain number of these coefficients based on the values that M and N take. And the computer is going to start scanning over uh, possible alpha MNs in search for functionals that behave this way. And if it finds one, then it looks for one that minimizes this object over here, which then yields a bound on the square of the OP coefficient. 
Okay? Good. Now, obviously, this is a numerical method at this point because no one can just, I mean, we did some plots like this, but we typically take this lambda to be pretty large, you know, and this number of these parameters is actually, you know, uh, pretty large, easily in the hundreds. So it's not something uh, you can do, you can do um, on your notebook, uh, but there are efficient algorithms by now anyway that allow you to, um, to scan for such coefficients and find such functionals uh, on, a, on a computer. Okay, good. Now, one, one issue that you might notice is that I keep saying all the time how there is an infinite number of primaries, right? Uh, and here I have an infinite sum, and I said this is an infinite sum over positive numbers, but when I put this on the computer, I cannot ask that the action of the functional is positive on an infinite number of things, right? It would take an infinite, number, an infinite amount of time for the computer to check this. So what do we do? Well, we truncate in some sense. We say, well, we're going to check things for specific deltas and Ls. Well, that's what you originally, people originally did. Then it was realized that you actually can impose such constraints in a way that allows you to have them be valid for any delta above a certain value, above the unitarity bound. I'm not going to explain how this works. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a translation of this, it's an approximation of this constraint that works for any value of delta. It becomes a polynomial constraint. If you want, you can set, uh, you can set uh, positivity bounds on polynomials based on how they behave. But then this L, this discrete spin, we still have to truncate in, right? We still have to say that I am going to impose this constraint for L up to, I don't know, 40. Because of the unitarity bound on operators of spin 40, which is, remember, D plus L minus 2 for, for tra traceless symmetric operators of spin uh, L, uh, the dimension of those operators gets larger and larger. Where they can start to appear of the unitarity gets larger and larger. And we already said, and you may look at those papers to see that the, um, the conformal block decomposition is uh, converging exponentially in the dimension of the operators. So not insisting on positivity of very, very high dimension operators is not expected to cause significant problems given that their contributions to the function is heavily suppressed, are heavily suppressed. Okay, and you can of course always check, take the functional that the computer gave you and go and check that it is positive on whatever spin you want to check later, right? So you can insist on positivity up to spin 40 and then take the function and apply it to spin 1255. And you will see that it is positive. Well, every time we've checked it's positive, of course we haven't checked everything because that's not possible, uh, but there has never been found a case where there is any tension, okay? And the rationale for this is that conformal blocks have diminishing contributions, exponentially suppressed as you look at higher and higher dimensions. Okay? Good. So this is how we get bounds on, on um, OP coefficients. Now, perhaps the most interesting bounds you have seen in the various bootstrap papers are not bounds on OP coefficients, but they are bounds on operator dimensions. Uh, like the ones we discussed in the beginning. Yes. You, do you want to use the mic? Um, why is it uh, important that we choose uh, the point where uh, Z equals Z bar equals one half? And is it enough to consider only just one point? It's in all the numerical searches that we do, this is the point we consider. Um, it's a point of, um, it's a point of, Simultaneous, simultaneous convergence, if you want, with an optimal radius of convergence for both sides of the crossing equation. Because in one side of the crossing equation, I, I mentioned it quickly, you have G at Z and Z bar. On the other side, you have Z, G at one minus Z, one minus Z bar. And there is only one point where these agree. Uh, this is the reason, so this, this Z equal a half point is a special point 
for the crossing equation, uh, convergence, you can show convergence is optimal at that point. And I don't know if another reason why. But you, you, could, you could choose other points and try to test things. Uh, but it has been found that this choice is, 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 very, is, very, is, very, is a very good one. It was the one I originally tried. I think originally it was because of these observations, right? That at z equals z bar, you get this, uh, uh, this behavior of the conformal blocks in that example. So then it persisted. Uh, and then people later understood the convergence of the expansion and so on and realized that, in fact, it's a very good choice. Perhaps I can say that if you move away, as Andy said, if you move away from the point, either one of the channels will converge less. So you will have the operator appearing in the OPE will be more and more important at high dimension. So if you want to drop operator to large dimension, you better stay in the best convergence point. In, in the example you did of light cone or analytical expansion, you actually go away from that point because you want to be sensitive to high dimensional operators. So it depends on, on, on the goal. But, but people have tried, and in the end. Very good, thanks. Okay, so, um, yeah, I, I was saying that perhaps, the more interesting constraints are the ones where you constrain the operator dimensions. And how do you do that? Okay, well, you start again from the crossing equation. You don't have much to play with. So let me write it down once again. And now I'm going to play the following game. I am going to choose one operator in theory. Let's say the identity. Okay. And um, I will send it to the other side. And I will say minus f 0, 0, is equal to an infinite sum over O's. Um, of lambda phi phi O squared. So this O's do not include the identity anymore. I kept this on this uh, other side, times F of delta L for the other stuff. Okay, so this is just uh, a rewriting, isolating one contribution. And now I will also make assumptions on these O's, what they are, what their spin might be, maybe not all of them, but maybe I'll make an assumption on a couple of them, okay, or one of them. I will assume, for example, that the first scalar operator inside this sum has dimension above a certain value. There be more scalars above that value, but at least the first one occurs at a certain value or higher, okay? I can make assumptions like this. And then I will choose that same functional after I make these assumptions, okay, and I will demand Again, scanning over such coefficients, as I showed here, I will demand the following, that alpha on F00 is 1, and alpha on F delta L is bigger than or equal to 0. If I am able to find such functional, I have proven that minus 1 is equal to a sum of positive numbers. And it better not be the case that you proved this, and therefore the assumptions you made are inconsistent with unitarity. Okay? This means that some of these lambda squares that you wanted to keep positive are actually not positive for this to work, and therefore you violated unitarity. So assumptions you made, if that can happen, uh, 
are inconsistent. with unitarity, and you can exclude those assumptions for the dimensions and spins that you made from possibly uh, uh, existing for a unitary CFT. Okay? So this is how you obtain uh, bounds on, on operator dimensions. If the computer, you go to the computer, you ask, is there such a functional? If there is one, then the computer will tell you uh, well, there is no such unitary CFT because you can use it to prove minus one is equal to the sum of positive numbers. If there isn't such a functional, the computer doesn't tell you that the assumption you made is consistent with unitarity because the functional you considered is a finite functional. You might be able to find another functional with which you'll be able to satisfy these conditions and exclude the corresponding spectrum. Maybe you can find a different functional by increasing this parameter lambda over here to have more derivatives uh, included. But when the computer tells you no, no means no. It does not mean maybe not. But when it tells you, oh, I cannot find a functional, it does not mean yes, it does not mean that the spectrum assumptions you made are consistent, it means that maybe they're consistent. I can't tell you no, but maybe. Okay? What you can then do is go and check various lambdas and see how the bounds behave. Say, okay, I'm gonna choose lambda to be 40. Consider up to like, I don't know, 20th derivatives in Z and 20th in Z bar. And maybe I'm, then I'm gonna make lambda be 50 or then 60 or whatever and I'm gonna observe how bounds change, and they do change, okay? So let me show you how they change. Maybe let's do it here. The result of this in, in our setting is that you make some choice for delta phi and maybe you look at the dimension of the operator phi squared, where by phi squared, I don't mean some weakly coupled version of the product of phi that you have to make, you know, precise using uh, methods of quantum field theory. What I mean by phi squared is that in the phi phi OPE, there is the identity and then there is this operator phi squared, meaning the leading operator beyond the identity that has spin zero, whatever that is. Okay, I write it as phi squared, basically having perturbation theory in mind, where I can make sense of what this means. But this is a contribution at any, uh, at any value of some coupling you might have. It's a non-perturbative contribution. So you should call it O, okay? It's some operator, we don't know what it is. I'll just call it phi squared because I have the perturbative uh, situation in mind. So I might go here and say, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose delta phi and I am going to impose the condition that the leading spin zero operator has a delta larger than some value, and then I'm gonna see what it, uh, what the, if, I, if the computer can find a functional, then I have excluded that possibility. So say you choose, so this is one, maybe this is, I don't know, 1.1, and let's say you choose delta phi equal 1.1, and you check delta phi squared equal to six. Is it possible? Well, it turns out the computer can find a functional. So this point is not allowed in any unitary CFT. And you can do the same thing for other delta phi's, 1.2, 1.3. And what, you turn, what it turns out is that you find some sort of bound like this. There is a certain curve. I think at this point, this is something like four, more or less for this example that we, uh, that we are considering. So for the example of the uh, scalar field in four dimensions. Yes? Of the dimension of, yeah, of the operator phi squared, yes. And such a curve is showing you that everything up here is not allowed because up there the computer can indeed find a functional 
but everything down here is allowed. Everything here is fine. This whole space is allowed by crossing uh, for unitary CFTs. And this is the bound that separates the two regions. So maybe we write here allowed and here excluded. Remember, this is a statement valid for unitary CFTs, okay? If you didn't insist on unitarity, you do not get this. We relied on lambda squared being positive, and we have also put in uh, unitarity bounds, lower bounds, for where the contributions we are checking uh, start, this Fs. Okay, any questions about this? Yes? Is there anything else you can use as here? Anything else you can... Yeah, if you relax unitarity, you can still look at the crossing equation in, in, you know, in an analytical way. Uh, you can still do that, but you cannot use this method to obtain bounds because they rely, it relies so heavily on these functionals and this lambda squared being positive. So this numerical approach does not work if you don't assume unitarity. Everything we've said up until now, of course, up until yesterday, it still works. You can still analyze it in non-unitary theories, but you cannot make the assumption that OPE coefficients squared are positive. Uh, why do you insist on uh, alpha of f to be more than zero if you know that the series converges? then it seems to enough to demand alpha of f to be zero, more than zero for a lot of deltas and L, and just to have some bound uh, for absolute value. Yeah, I don't want to, um, I don't want to be checking this for specific deltas. I want to make this constraint be valid for any delta above the unitarity bound. So I don't have to make assumptions about where operators might actually lie. So I fix my spin, and then I say, can I implement this constraint for any delta above the unitarity bound? And it turns out that there is a way to do it, and this is why this yields rigorous bounds, if you want, because I didn't make any assumptions or wh on where the deltas might lie. I converted this into a constraint that's valid for any delta above the unitarity bound. It, originally, when people got the first plots out of this, indeed they did things like this. They discretized in delta and insisted on positivity for only certain values of those deltas that they discretized, and then they made the grid that they chose denser and checked how things behave. Um, but then people realized that you can actually impose this constraint for any delta, and this makes the bounds more uh, rigorous. Sure, yes, of course, yes. Sure, sure. That will entail, you know, making assumptions now about how things behave. And you can play such games, absolutely. But the most, you know, the most general situation is where you don't start doing this. But you can certainly do this, yes. There, there is no... But it's an extra assumption on what that CFT might, be, might look like which you might have some motivation why it might look like that, and you may want to put that in to isolate that solution that other CFTs might not satisfy that constraint because other CFTs might not, might not satisfy that constraint, but here I'm describing the most you know, general situation. Okay, good. So this is what people did. So this was in four dimensions. So this type of bound, this was in the original paper from 2008, uh, where all this logic of using these functionals and, you know, all that was explained, uh, they focused in D equal 4 because in D equal 4 they had explicit expressions for the conformal blocks. And so they could just use these hypergeometric functions and just take derivatives easily on the computer and so on. Um, 
and the bound, okay, it was kind of a surprise that you got this bound, but it didn't really show anything uh, spectacular. Very soon thereafter, people realized that <laughs> this logic can be applied in any dimension. I think in the original paper, paper they also considered d equal 2, if I remember correctly. They also considered d equal 2, uh, and they found bounds that came very close to the um, minimal models in d equal 2. Okay? Because in d equal 2, they also had, of course, analytic expressions for the blocks. Later on, interest developed around analyzing such bounds in d equal 3. Because in d equal 3, we know many phase transitions. We know the connection with critical phenomena. And we know of all these transitions. We talked in the beginning about the Ising model, for example. So there was a, a great motivation to perhaps get a bound in three dimensions in a theory that has Z2 symmetry, because the Ising model, remember, has this Z2 symmetry where you can flip all the spins and uh, you have invariance. And when they did that, so in the Ising case, if you were to describe it with uh, some sort of Lagrangian, it's again a scalar field phi, and you would write something like 1 half d mu phi, d mu phi, minus 1 over 4 factorial, lambda phi to the fourth. That you would write, that's something you would write in, for example, d equal 4 minus epsilon dimensions. Uh, Wilson and Fisher did this, um, made this assumption that I may use d, four, d equal to 4 minus epsilon. And if I send epsilon to 1, this theory has Z2 symmetry. There is also a mass term, a phi squared term, but you may throw that away at the critical point. When I send epsilon to 1, I recover a theory that is in the same universality class as the Ising model we described in the, in the first lecture. So this was the Wilson-Fisher So in the bootstrap, people said, well, Wilson Fisher is uh, starting with epsilon small and then uses perturbation theory to compute things and then sends epsilon to one after some resummations, perhaps. It's not a very controlled thing to do. But then people said, of course, with the bootstrap, it's completely non-perturbative. We should be able to do a similar thing. We should be able to take this phi. Typically, in this literature, phi is called sigma. So let's call it delta sigma. And the operator phi squared is called epsilon. So this is because of the terminology we use to identify operators in the Ising model. Sigma is the spin operator. Epsilon is sort of the spin squared operator. Okay? So they plot it, delta sigma, delta epsilon. And this, we are in d equal 3 now. So the lowest dimension sigma can have is 1 half. And in the free theory, the lowest dimension epsilon will have, well, in the free theory, the dimension epsilon will have is 1. It could have dimension lower than 1, because the unitarity bound is at 1 half, and it's a scalar. Anyway, they applied exactly the same logic as I did there in d equal 3 now. And what they found, and I should say that there is a z2 symmetry. OK? In other words, when I do the phi phi OPE, I don't allow phi on the other side, because that would violate the z2 symmetry. So what they, when they did this, they found something that looked like this. There was a certain change in the behavior of the bound. It was going up like this, and then it took a sharp turn and started going to the right. And it happened to be exactly at positions that you knew from, say, the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, or even experiments which measure the critical exponents, that correspond to the scaling dimensions of operators in the Ising universality class. And as far as I know, this was a surprise to the people that not only do you get a bound, the bound gets close to being saturated by a theory you know exists. And it gets saturated in this non-trivial way by a change in the slope.
So this was, uh, if you want, the most impressive uh, early result of the bootstrap that this bound, remember everything here is allowed and everything up here is excluded. So it's not like we isolated Ising or anything with this method, everything below is allowed, but it's curious that the bound is saturated by, uh, by, the, um, but then by the non conformal field theory. Okay, so uh, of course after these results, a lot of activity um, started to happen in the bootstrap and by now we have many such bounds, but what we don't have is a concrete analytical understanding of when such kinks might appear. They are, if you want, an experimental observation. In some cases we can understand how operators behave for the kinks to appear, but we cannot say predict that, oh, if you did this, you know, bootstrap for this four point function, you would find a kink in that bound. There is no way to predict that I know of a priori where you might find a kink uh, of this type. So numerically, of course, we observe them. So in these numerical experiments, we observe them, but we don't have a very a great analytical understanding of where they come from. Okay, so let's, let's take a break and we'll continue with more numerical bootstrap in a little bit. Okay, l let's meet in 10 minutes again. Okay, so uh, I said I would say it before, but I didn't say it, someone reminded me to say it, that um, we had this parameter lambda, we were taking uh, derivatives uh, of, the, of, the, of the convolved blocks, but up to a certain degree, bounded by that parameter lambda, and the bounds change depending on what that lambda is, but at sufficiently high lambda, they sort of stop changing and especially around points where you know a CFT exists, they kind of get stuck. They may change a little bit away from those points, but they do get stuck at points where you know a CFT exists. Taking a, of course, taking a stronger functional should not, bound, should, should not um, exclude a CFT you know exists because then you did something wrong, right? Uh, so it just shows that these points are sort of robust and at large enough number of derivatives, you do see that the bounds sort of converge. They stop changing much, okay? Uh, of course, it's like, again, these are all uh, numerical observations, okay? Okay, so this was the surprising result that got a lot of people excited that using this method, you might even be able to provide very good numerical estimates for the Eisen universality class, which is non-perturbative, and through Wilson-Fisher-like methods, you may, you may uh, provide some estimates for critical exponents, but here we have a non-perturbative method that you are now able to use to derive constraints for these critical exponents, which are related to these dimensions of these operators. Um, and so, what more can we do? Is it just this kink, or can we do more? So the next people, that, uh, the next thing that people tried is the so-called mixed correlator. Bootstrap. Mixed correlator meaning that to derive that bound, we took sigma, we took its four point function, and we looked at the dimension of epsilon in the sigma sigma OPE. So maybe I should write here that in the sigma sigma OPE, goes like one plus epsilon plus other operators of zero spin, then of course there are operators of spin two and so on and so forth. Typically, the way we, um, the way we uh, name operators like this are in the, you have the identity epsilon and then the next scalar is epsilon prime and then epsilon double prime and so on. And in spin two, you have the stress energy tensor which is the leading operator, T mu nu, then we have T prime, T double prime and so on. So you put primes for the uh, operators. Uh, that's, the, that's the usual, uh, notation people use in the literature if you look at these papers. Okay, good. So then what we did, what, what people did is, instead of just considering the four point function of sigma, they said, well, let's also consider 
a four-point function uh, of two sigmas and two epsilons. And along with it, let's include the four-point function of four epsilons. It turns out that you have to do this for a reason you will see in a little bit. Um, so you take the operator that you were bounding here in the sigma sigma OPE and you use it as an external operator. You enlarge the system of correlation functions you're looking at and you're supposed to impose crossing on all these four, all, all these four point functions. Satisfying crossing at, this four point, at the level of this four point function um, is, is one thing, but satisfying it for all of these four point function may give stronger constraints. Okay, it can certainly not give weaker constraints, but it may give stronger constraints. Okay, so let's see how that works. In order to understand how this, uh, this can be done, so far I've written the simplest expressions I could for conformal blocks. Now I'm going to have to, or for four-point functions and conformal blocks, now I'm going to have to write a more complicated expression. Let's look at how the four-point function looks if we have scalar operators everywhere, but they are not the same. It's phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4, with corresponding scaling dimensions, delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, delta 4, okay? So these are different. Now, the conformal block decomposition of this is the following. You have 1 over x, 1, 2, to the power delta 1 plus delta 2, x, 3, 4, to the power delta 3 plus delta 4, then you have some other funny factor here, x24 over x14 to the power delta 1 minus delta 2. Then another funny factor, x14 over x13 to the power delta 3 minus delta 4. And then you have an inf well, let's write it down here. And then you have an infinite sum over three point function coefficients. phi 1, phi 2, so I'm, I'm doing this in this decomposition where I use the OPE in this, um, in this way. So you have lambda phi 1, phi 2, oh, phi 3, phi 4, oh, and then I have an associated conformal block which now depends on delta and L of this O, but also depends on the dimensions of these guys, the external operators, okay? So it depends on delta 1 minus delta 2 and it also depends on delta 3 minus delta 4, and it's a function of u and v. So now, for non-identical scalar operators, the block is a little more complicated. Okay, it has this extra dependence on these parameters of the, uh, on the dimensions of the external operators. Um, and there is also this, this, this funny factor. Okay? So now you already see that there might be a problem, because we will be able to overcome this problem, but you see here the product of two different things that are supposed to be real. The problem of two real things, product of two real things, not necessarily positive, okay? Before we had the square, and that's fine, but here we don't have the square, we have just the product. So that's gonna be something we have to deal with. Okay, so we know the constraints that arise from sigma, 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 sigma. We already worked them out. So let me write them in this new notation if you want. So there is a sum over lambda sigma, sigma O squared of operators O, uh, and then there is F um, of delta L UV, and here, I may, I may write sigma, 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 sigma to remind myself that it's the block, uh, is the convolved block associated with this four-point function, okay? It's the simple one, the one we've been talking about. Okay, so this is the case here, and maybe I will put a plus sign here to indicate that these are only even spin operators, okay? So these are only 
even spin operators in the uh, exchange in the sigma sigma OPE. Okay, so that's one constraint. We knew this already. We have to include it into the system. Now, the second constraint will come from epsilon, 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 epsilon. This four-point function, again, it's a single scalar. So again, I can write, but now I can write a similar equation, but now the three-point function coefficients that appear are not those in the sigma, sigma OP, but those in the epsilon, epsilon OP. But again, it's a square here, and we have an associated block, uh, convolved block for delta L now, I'm just writing this. It doesn't really make a difference because it's the same uh, scalar. Uh, but let me write it down just to label things. But now, let me consider sigma epsilon, sigma epsilon. And this will be decomposed in the following way. I will bring these two operators together and then these two. And on the cross channel, I will take this guy with the last one and then uh, the middle two, okay? Now again, with this choice, I get a squared OPE coefficient because in both channels, I have the OPE coefficient of sigma epsilon, the, the contribution of O in the OPE of sigma epsilon, of the sigma epsilon here, so I will get lambda squared. And in the other channel, I also have sigma epsilon, sigma epsilon. Okay? So in both channels, I get a squared OP coefficient. But now, this F is going to be that of sigma epsilon, sigma epsilon, which is different than in form than this block because it has this extra... Um, it, ha it will have some extra factors. I will show you what it looks like in a little bit. Another difference is that here I cannot put a plus. Here the operator uh, can have either even or odd spin because these are not the same scalar anymore. So now odd spin operators are allowed in the OP. So this is even and odd spin. Okay. So you see that by doing this, by including this operator, what we immediately get is access to more of the spectrum of the theory. Because before, we had access only to the even spin operators in the theory. Now, we have access to the odd spin operators of the theory. Moreover, these operators here are different than the operators that appear here, even the scalars. And the reason that they're different is because in the sigma epsilon OPE, the operators that appear on the, on the right hand side are Z2 odd, because sigma is Z2 odd, and epsilon is Z2 even. So not only do you get access to other spins that you didn't before, you also get access to a completely different, but under global symmetry, part of the, of the, of the uh, spectrum of the theory. Okay. Now, the turn, it turns out that so far we've been looking at the correlation functions, four-point functions of identical operators, and I told you that from them there is only one crossing equation you can derive. Because if you took the OPE this way, you get one crossing equation. But if you took it some other way, it's an identity of the blocks, and it does not give you something non-trivial. This is no longer true if you have different operators. So the way, one way to uh, get another crossing equation is to do the OPE at a different channel, or to do it in the same channel, but considering a different arrangement of the operators. So, Maybe I'll just, let's see what I did. I did something like sigma, epsilon, epsilon, sigma. So I'll consider this arrangement of operators now in the four-point function. I'll do the OPE again in the same way. And now you see that when you do the sigma, epsilon, epsilon, sigma, that's fine. It's what we got before. But in the cross channel, you don't have sigma, epsilon, epsilon, sigma. You have sigma, sigma with epsilon, epsilon. So in the cross channel, you'll get the OPE coefficient Lambda sigma sigma O times lambda epsilon epsilon O. It's not, it's not going to be a square anymore. Okay, so what does this look like? So let me write this in a little bit more detail. 
So it turns out that, looks, that this looks like V to the delta epsilon sum over O lambda sigma epsilon O squared um, So this is one contribution, and the minus one to the L here comes because of the fact that in this channel I do sigma epsilon OPE, but then I do epsilon sigma OPE. And I can flip them, but when I flip them, I have to change x1 to x2, and all odd spin operators we have, which have in front of them a, a, an odd power of x1 minus x2 will have to pick up a minus sign. So that's what the minus... Uh, that's where the minus one to the L comes from. Another thing to, to note is that this block, sigma epsilon epsilon sigma, is not the same as sigma epsilon sigma epsilon. Okay? But anyway, on the other channel, you get U to the one half delta sigma plus delta epsilon. Um, and then you get, again, the infinite sum, now only over even spin operators because we have the sigma sigma OPE and the epsilon epsilon OPE, so now we're going to have only even spin operators. So maybe, to make it more clear, maybe I'll write this as plus minus here, just to, uh, to have this notation um, everywhere. So this over here is plus minus, but here it's just O, O, O plus. Um, okay, and now we have lambda sigma sigma O plus, lambda epsilon epsilon O plus, and then the associated conformal block G delta L sigma sigma epsilon epsilon. So this is the crossing equation that you get from uh, this arrangement of the operators in the four-point function. Okay. Now, if you remember the form of the crossing equation we had before, it was very easy to get this F because it was uh, symmetric under the exchange of U and V. On the one side, we got U to the delta times the blocks of U comma V, the other, uh, or sorry, V to the delta times the blocks of U com at U comma V. The other side, we got uh, U to the delta times the blocks of V comma U. So it was easy to just bring it to the other side and construct this object F with the minus in between, right? Here, we don't get something symmetric. Here you have V to the delta epsilon. Here you have U to the delta sigma plus delta epsilon over two. But you can symmetrize and anti-symmetrize in V and U. And this will give you, from this, you'll get two independent uh, constraints, okay? And one of them will involve the same F, which will be with the minus in between. The other one will involve some other F with a plus in between. Okay? So this equation over here is two constraints, two independent constraints after symmetrizing and anti-symmetrizing in the variables u and v, okay? So total, what we have, I'm gonna write what it looks like, but what we, to what we have in total is one from here, two, three, four, five. We have five crossing equations now uh, for the mixed correlator system uh, of all these guys, okay. And just to, just to uh, reiterate this point that is important that I labeled here the spin of the operators. I did not label the Z2 symmetry, but you can see that by looking at the, at the blocks, right? If you have sigma epsilon, then you know that the operators that will be appearing are Z2 odd because they will inherit, inherit the uh, Z2 oddness of sigma because epsilon is Z2 even. But if you have sigma sigma, you're gonna get Z2 even operators. So the global symmetry is of course important uh, when you look at this, um, what operators contribute to this, uh, to these sums. 
So the object, this f you define, this convolved block, maybe we'll give it a new index, plus minus, and it will depend in general on the external operators, i, j, k, l, and this takes the following form. There is delta j plus delta k over two times g It depends on delta ij, delta kl, where what I mean by delta ij is delta i minus delta j. And then plus or minus, because of the symmetrization and anti-symmetrization, you'll get either the plus or the minus. Uh, and this is, sorry, a function of u and v, plus or minus u to the, uh, let me see, I think this is the same. over two times the block, uh, which now depends again on delta ij and delta kl of v comma u. So this is this f that you will define, and all the f's I've written so far are f minuses, but in that equation you'll get one f minus and one f plus. Okay. So now, what you can do is take these five equations and write them in the following way. Put all these constraints together, and what you can do is separate things as follows. You can make, a, you can make it is the same operators that will appear in the sigma sigma OPE and in the epsilon epsilon OPE because the Z2 symmetry is the same and the spins are the same because it's only even spins due to both symmetry. So you can make a vector of OPE coefficients, a two-dimensional vector in this case, and in the middle here, you're gonna have a certain matrix, a certain vector rather of uh, matrices, let me call it and then on this side, you will have again I will write down what this is, but right now, since we have five equations, this is a five-dimensional vector, and each entry of that vector is a two-by-two two matrix, okay? So this is part of the crossing equation plus the rest, the rest looks like and again this is a vector um, and what we have achieved now is something here that is positive and we can recast the positivity condition that we require as a positive semi-definiteness condition of a certain matrix. So instead of looking at positivity acting on um, these Fs, we are going to look uh, and impose positive definiteness of a matrix of these Fs, actually of five matrices of these Fs. Well, not really five of them separately, because we will take a functional that is a five vector that we will contract this with. And so from these five equations, each for every entry of this vector, we're gonna get one big equation involving the components, the five components of that functional, which we will scan over in order to look for, uh, for these functionals that give, us, uh, uh, that give us a contradiction which allow us to exclude assumptions on the operator spectrum. Okay, so let me show you what this, these, um, these Vs look like. I know this is, you know, a little bit complicated and maybe the presentation is not optimal, but I don't see a way to present this better. It requires you guys to sit down and do it and then you'll see just, that's how it is. Okay, so this V minus, since we have 
five equation, it's a five vector, and it involves, so when I write here F minus, I mean, did I just erase it? No, it's up there. F minus, I mean the one with the minus in between. Uh, so sigma epsilon, sigma epsilon, then there is um, some minus one to the L, F minus sigma epsilon, sigma epsilon, and then there is a minus minus one to the L, F minus sigma epsilon, um, epsilon sigma. Notice, I think this is epsilon sigma. Every time you see a minus one to the L, it must be epsilon sigma and sigma epsilon because that's where the minus one to the L comes from, right? From switching epsilon and sigma. Okay, so this is V minus and then this V plus is again a vector, but now it's a vector of two by two matrices. And there's five of them in here. I'm not gonna write them all down. The first one is F minus sigma 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 zero zero zero. Uh, the second one is also easy to write down zero 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 f minus epsilon 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 and you can see right that when you take that uh, vector of OPE coefficients you pick the first matrix here you will get lambda sigma sigma o then since it's the one one component of the uh, entry of the matrix you're going to pick the one one component of that column as well so you're going to get lambda sigma sigma o squared times this f minus so that's one of your crossing equations and since this is zero that's all it is Right? So just go through the algebra and you will see that you can rearrange the crossing equation in this vector form involving these matrices here of the um, F pluses and the F minuses. Now, that's the crossing equation. Well, it's five equations in this case. What we can do is now look for a functional alpha, which is a vector, so this alpha is alpha one through alpha five in this case, and you dot this functional into that equation, okay? When you dot this functional into that equation, you are going to get the action of the functional, you, you are gonna get now one equation since you took a dot product. You're gonna get one equation involving all these alpha one through alpha five. Each one of them will have an expansion in this derivative, sum over alpha mn's D, M, M, uh, M derivatives in Z, N derivatives in Z bar, and you will be scanning over five times as many things as you were scanning over before because you have more of these functionals. But anyway, that's what you do, and it turns out that you gain quite a bit after you make suitable assumptions. At this point, if you were just to run this and look for, uh, well, I just erased it, but if you were to run this and try to use this larger functional to get a bound on delta sigma delta epsilon, you'd get exactly the same bound as you got before. You would not get any improvement if you did not make any further assumptions. But now we recall that we have access to more of the spectrum. In particular, we have access to the Z2 odd part of the spectrum. And we can make assumptions there. We can in fact also make assumptions for the Z2 even part of the spectrum. In the Ising model, it describes the universality class of water, for example, or of the Ising magnet. And you know that the phase diagram of water is two dimensional. In order to get water to be at the critical point, you need to tune the pressure and you need to tune the temperature. And once you do it, you're at the critical point. This means that there are two parameters in the corresponding conformal field theory that can possibly be relevant operators. Relevant operators meaning one of them has to correspond to the temperature and the other one to the pressure. These are the only ones that could potentially affect your theory in the infrared. They can be relevant in the infrared. And that's sigma and epsilon. So the assumption you can now make is that the sig sigma is the only operator 
that is z 2 odd scalar and relevant, and that um, epsilon is the only operator that is z 2 even scalar and relevant. So you will make the assumptions that delta sigma prime is larger than 3, and delta epsilon prime is larger than 3. OK? And these are physically motivated assumptions, as I just described. And then what you find, doing this mixed um, this mixed correlator bootstrap is that around the point where you previously had um, that kink, you get an island. And then there is some other region here to the right that's allowed. This over here inside the island is allowed. But everything out here is excluded. So you get an isolated allowed region on this plane, delta sigma, delta epsilon plane, after you make these assumptions that sigma and epsilon are the unique z2 odd and z2 even scalar, primary, uh, scalar um, of course primary, but also relevant operators in the theory. Uh, and then you get this separation of this particular point. Well, we believe it's a point. Of course, numerically, you're going to find an extended region that contains it, but the point is, is that it is isolated from the rest of the allowed region, and it's right at where the Ising CFT lives. Uh, so doing the mixed correlator bootstrap turned the kink, if you want, into an island um, like this. And why did this work? The understanding of why this worked can be seen in some other bound. Suppose you took this system and you computed a bound on the dimension of sigma prime, which I now have access to. Before, I didn't have access to the dimension of sigma prime because I was only looking at the sigma sigma OP, and that only has epsilons, epsilon prime, and so on. But now I can look at the dimension of delta sigma prime, of sigma prime as a function of the dimension of sigma. And it turns out, say this is your 0.518 point, for delta sigma, it turns out that this bound starts kind of like this, then it has something like this. It does something like this. And this is where 3 is. Which then says that if you set delta sigma prime to be higher than 3, so remember this is excluded, and this is allowed, including this hump, if you exclude, if you, re if you require that delta sigma prime is larger than 3, as we did, then the only region that will remain allowed is the region around this point. Okay? And that's where you get the island. I mean, eventually, this is still allowed. That's where you get that other allowed region. But this is what creates the separation between um, the island and the rest of the allowed region. Okay. Yes. Can you give some intuition as to why um, why the extra crossing equations are essentially redundant? They don't give you anything, any new information until you impose any extra assumptions. Uh, Alessandro. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <clears throat> the point is you can find sol independent solution of both. So you can find a solution where you have lambda sigma sigma operator, non-zero, but lambda epsilon epsilon operator zero, and vice versa. So if you don't force them to interact, they wouldn't. They won't. So these assumptions precisely do this. They, they force them to interact. They force the off-diagonal term to be non-zero somehow. And, and then you have to find a common spectrum that, that satisfies the, both equations. If you don't input the gaps, then you find solutions of the two single correlator uh, bootstrap that 
satisfy them independently. I think that that's the intuition. Very good. So um, it's quite non-trivial uh, how these crossing equations work together. It's already non-trivial how one crossing equation uh, works to constrain CFTs. When you put many of them together, uh, the, uh, the um, combined constraints are even, even more non-trivial. Okay, so this is how mixed correlators work. And the final thing I want to talk about is what to do when, uh, like other applications of this. I mean, this, this, this method is very, very powerful. It is numerical, so may, perhaps it's not up to the taste of everyone, but uh, it is a non-perturbative method, and we don't have many of those. So whenever you can get this, is a, this all these statements are fully non-perturbative. I made no assumptions about any couplings being small or any ends to be large or anything like that, okay? Um, and so since it's non-perturbative and we have so very few methods that are non-perturbative, it is, it, is, it is very important to analyze it and it's very extensible. You can take this method and use it in any space-time dimension that you like. Uh, you can put supersymmetry or not. It's up to you to include supersymmetry. This introduces, of course, some complication because once you include supersymmetry, you have to think about superconformal multiplets, not just conformal multiplets. And superconformal multiplets contain each one of them a finite number of conformal multiplets uh, of operators that are conformal primaries but superconformal descendants. And the symmetry relates, the supersymm supersymmetry relates how the various contributions to the operator product expansion will arise. So if you really want to be using supersymmetry, you have to compute. Uh, something called a superconformal block, um, which not only encodes the contributions of the prime of the descendants of every given primary, but the contributions of the super descendants of every given of every given super primary. So there are associated notions in supersymmetry that complicate uh, things. Nevertheless, the method works, and it has been used for n equals one supersymmetric theories in four dimensions, n equals two, n equals four super young Mills, uh, and lots of great progress has been made in understanding aspects of supersymmetric theories in four dimensions using the bootstrap. Um, another thing you can do is apply it for theories that have um, global symmetry that isn't just some simple Z2. Maybe it can be more complicated. For example, a very famous class of models that um, people talk about, so when you have in three dimensions are the, when you have three dimensions are the 3D ON models. Okay? Now there are many models in 3D with various degrees of symmetry that are important for applications to phase transitions in all sorts of condensed matter systems. Uh, there is really a lot of them. And you can analyze them using these methods, basically showing you how it works for the ON models uh, will allow you to go and apply it to any global symmetry you might like. So now, since we have a symmetry, uh, an ON symmetry, we have N scalar fields and we put them all in the vector representation of this ON symmetry. So now, our correlation function will look like this. This IJKL index is not the same as the IJKL up there, it's just an ON vector index. Um, what we're doing here is we're taking the four-point function, so essentially we're taking four vector representations of ON and we're multiplying them. The result of multiplying representations is not an irreducible representation of the group, you have to decompose the product of representations into irreducible representations under the group on the right-hand side. Decomposing that uh, means that you construct, construct the corresponding invariant subspaces of the four-point function, okay? And how do you do this? Well, um, what you need to do it is find and enumerate all possible four-index invariant tensors of ON. 
And we know that in ON, there is only one primitive invariant tensor you cannot write as a product of something else, and that's delta ij. That's the only thing you can have in an ON symmetric theory. You can take phi with another phi, and the only invariant you can make is phi squared. You cannot do anything else, just the, the norm of the vector. Uh, and all higher, uh, uh, all invariant tensors of higher rank, for example, with four indices, will be products of that delta ij, right? So when you write down the crossing equation, and again, you will decompose it in some way, but now you're gonna have two sums. There's gonna be a sum over what I call here i, there's gonna be your sum over all i's, and then there's gonna be some projector that will carry the indices i, j, k, l, and then you're gonna have your lambda phi phi o squareds and your blocks. And these are simple blocks because all operators are identical, okay? There's some representation theory that you need to work out to figure out what these projectors are. So for every projector that exists in the ON model, you get, for every four index projector that exists, you get one crossing equations one crossing equation. And these projectors are basically telling you, are basically telling you, um, um, giving you the following information. If you look at the phi phi OPE, you know that what you will get if this is a, if this is a, um, a vector of ON, you're gonna get to write delta IJ times S, where S are singlets under the group under ON, and this S over here are singlets, but can have any spin. Well, in this case, they can only have even spin because this is the same operator. But you will also get operators that are this um, traceless symmetric, the two index traceless symmetric of ON will appear. This is just taking a vector with another vector and decomposing into, in, into irreducible representations on the other side. And then there will be this other one this anti-symmetric representation. And the corresponding projectors at the level of the four-point function tell you how the two-point function of these things look like. So this one over here for the four-point function of S, for the, uh, sorry, the two-point function of S will be just proportional to a number. There is no indices. So this will give you an associated projector that looks like delta IJ, delta KL. So that's your projector for that representation at the level of the four-point function. This will give you something that looks like delta IK delta JL plus delta IL uh, delta JK minus two over N delta IJ delta KL. This is the projector to the uh, trace symmetric representation. And this will give you something that looks like delta IK delta JL minus delta IL delta JK. So in this case, this will be your P1, P2 will be this, and P3 will be this. And for each one of them, they are independent projectors, so they will decompose your crossing equation into three separate equations for each one of them. So basically, the way this works is you take your phi i, phi j, phi k, phi l, you do the OPE this way, you get this p i, j, k, l's. When you do it this way, sorry, when you do it this way, what you get is the p i, l, k, j. Okay? When you write this p i, l, k, j's in the form of this p i, j, k, l's by moving the indices around, this will relate in the crossing equation operators in different representations, okay? So what you will get is a crossing equation that looks like this. There's gonna be a sum over operators, lambda phi phi s, so these are the OS's, the singlets, squared, and then there will be uh, uh, one, two, three entries here, depending on what survived when you did these manipulations, then there's gonna be a sum 
over the traceless uh, symmetric ones, lambda phi phi o t squared, and then again three entries. And then finally, there is a sum over the anti-symmetric ones, lambda phi phi o a squared, whatever entries you find in the crossing equation, and you're going to get three crossing equations um, out of this process because you have three dependent invariant tensors. These are three different sets of OPE coefficients. They all appear squared. And now I can do the same thing I did for mixed correlators. I can take a vector functional alpha that has three entries, dot it into this equation, and I'm going to get one big equation that I again then send to the computer. I scan over the coefficients of those functionals and so on, and I can get bounds. And what's the result of this bounds? This entries over here will depend on the parameter n that I choose for my ON model, right? And depending on the n I choose, the bounds will look different. So for example, if you're interested in finding out what is the largest dimension for the leading singlet that appears in the OPE of phi with phi, it could be the leading traceless symmetric, it doesn't matter, it could be the leading anti-symmetric. You can do either now because they're decomposed. But let's look at the singlet. So this is delta phi. Now we'll call it delta S. And this is the leading scalar singlet in the phi phi OPE. Depending on the end you choose, you get things like this, say for n equal 2. If you chose n equal 1, you'll get again the delta sigma delta epsilon uh, bound that you had from the Ising case. right? But then what happens is these bounds get really sharp like this. And maybe this is for, say, n equal 20. So the kinks that you see get really sharp. They're not so sharp for n equal 2, n equal 3, but they get very sharp for large n. And the reason for this is that the bound has to go up very fast because we know that at large n, the dimension of phi goes to 1 half in three dimensions, they are independent large n calculations, and the dimension of phi squared of the leading singlet, uh, you know, phi i, phi i, the contracted one, uh, goes to two. So we know that delta phi goes like one half plus order one over n, and delta s goes like two plus order one over n. And this we know from large n computations, completely independently. And therefore, at large n, the bootstrap has to go, the bound has to go up very fast because it has to not exclude the theory we know exists. Okay? And then you can play the same game. You can do global symmetry and mixed correlators. And everything goes through. There is no complication. It's just a little bit of a group theory problem. You work it all out. And again, you can convert these kinks into islands, similarly to what we did before, with uh, you know, assumptions like we made before, that there is uh, only a few operators that are relevant. Um, what, you can, what you can also do is break ON symmetry and, for example, preserve subgroups of ON, in which case representations like this, you start from a vector, but some of the representations of ON on the right-hand side will be reducible under the subgroup that you want to preserve. So they will split. Maybe the trace, the symmetric, will split into two representations that are irreducible under the subgroup you want to preserve. It's just group theory. This is not complicated. But then you'll get more projectors than these three, right? And then you get more sectors under the global symmetry that you're trying to preserve. So it will give you more crossing equations, perhaps. But you can apply exactly the same logic and analyze uh, uh, crossing using uh, pretty much any global symmetry that you want to impose. You just have to work out some group theory. So these are all statements to uh, show you that this method is really, uh, you can use it in many, in many, many situations. And it gives non-trivial results pretty much every time it has been tried. So, and it's non-perturbative, so it's worth using it. Um, 
I don't have, I don't know how much time I have, but I don't have more to say, so. Okay, well, thank you guys for your attention. I hope at least some of you got at least something out of it. Uh, thanks for all the questions, and it was uh, great fun for me. Any other question? Island structure still hold in the Owen case? Yes, yes. You get uh, the archipelago that has been, uh, you get islands for every end, one island for every end. There is something similar you can say about these kings. In a cert there is a certain sparse sparseness of the spectrum with relative to the spectrum of the theories allowed around the kink. Some operators at the kink uh, are, are gone and there is some sparseness of the spectrum um, that you can use to motivate why this slope changes. Um, Beyond that, something more concrete, I don't, I don't know something more concrete as an explanation for these kings. Okay, if there are no other questions, let's end it for the nice lectures again.